Welcome to A People's History of Violence, the podcast where we go entirely too deep into history, assassinations, affairs, crime, police, conspiracies, cover-ups, terrors, and trials. I am your co-host, Isaac. And I'm your co-host, Peter. And it's Halloween, so this is a spooky episode. Yeah, no, no. Uh, actually, we're rounding out our well, Rosenberg series. We have one more episode after this, but we had an amazing interview um, with Julius and Ethel Rosenberg's uh, first born uh, eldest son, Michael Mirapol, who has been professor of economics up here in New England uh, and is the author of the book. I love this title, Surrender, How the, How the Clinton Administration Completed the Reagan Revolution, uh, mm-hmm. as well as several books, along with his brother, Robert Mirapol, on their parents' case, We Are Your Sons, the first and second edition, and uh, they edited the Rosenberg Letters, which is the complete prison correspondent. It's a great interview. He's, you know, a really uh, smart, sharp guy. Uh, just to be clear, he's he's the opposite of spooky. He's a very straightforward, articulate, thoughtful, and fair-minded guy. You would kind of figure that if your parents were, you know, regardless of guilt or innocence, I think it's fair to say that they were railroaded. Parents were railroaded by the state that you would uh, be excused for not wanting to hear anything at all negative about them. But that's not what's going on with Michael Mirapol. He is really interested in getting at the truth of the case. And then then I think you and I both uh, came to the conclusion that we hope we are as as spry and intellectually vigorous at, at his ages. Oh, absolutely. I absolutely. feel like we have trouble keeping up. <laughs> For real. Yeah. Uh, so with that, listeners, uh, enjoy. Uh, hi, welcome to A People's History of Violence. I am your co-host, Isaac. And I'm your co-host, Peter. And today we actually have a very special guest with us, uh, the son of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, uh, Michael Mirapol. Michael, how are you? I'm fine. And uh, my brother always wants me to remind everybody that I'm the older one and therefore the more doddering one. <laughs> <laughs> brother Robert. So, Michael, I, I know we've chatted off and on uh, by email and over the phone and everything. And I am not a professional interviewer. Uh, I'm just a pontificator who, who likes to nerd out a lot about these topics and is deeply interested in them on a human level and everything like that. But I know that with this case, and you're welcome to pause me where anything is overwrought or I say anything badly or anything like that. Um, but I know that you've been involved in this case, not just as a family member, but actually kind of as a participant in the legal and political process of trying to first prevent your parents from being executed, prevent the sentence from being carried out, and in unmasking the nature of the case in the decades afterwards um, from the time that you were a child. And do you think you could tell us something about that? Well, yeah, it's very interesting that you mentioned my mini role as a child. Um, It just so happens that uh, Sometime, um, I can't remember how many years ago, maybe five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, the National Archives decided to sort of do a series on letters to presidents. And they, they actually contacted me with two original handwritten letters that I had sent to President Eisenhower. And what was actually fascinating about it is I didn't remember the first one. Mm. Wow. Um, I, I guess the first one was when I was, uh, when I was in 1952, uh, when I was living in New Jersey, but ended up spending at least one afternoon at the office of the National Committee to Secure Justice in the Rosenberg case. And I was, of course, thrilled to see these wonderful people there who were trying to save my parents' lives. And I don't remember if it was somebody who encouraged me or if I did it on my own, but I did write a letter to Eisenhower asking for clemency. Yeah. Now, for some reason, in June of 1953, when Robbie and I were actually went to Washington, D.C., um, as part of a giant uh, picket that it was round the clock, it was the last week of my parents' lives, they got the idea for me to write a more formal letter 
the second letter was actually stimulated by the fact that an American named William Otis had been arrested in Czechoslovakia and the president of Czechoslovakia freed him because his wife had made a direct appeal. So they thought uh, the members of the committee to um, secure justice in the Rosenberg case thought that another letter from me that built on the Otis thing might work. And it also worked because unbeknownst to me at that moment, my mother was writing a personal letter to Eisenhower, which was only to be delivered if all else had failed. And in fact, that the last day that Robbie and I visited them in Sing Sing prison, she read that letter aloud for our lawyer, the, the lawyer, Manny Block. And there was a reference to Otis and I could have caught it because I had written about Otis in the letter. And what was interesting about the second letter, which I, I, I reproduced in We Are Your Sons, not even remembering the first one, is that I thought it was a mistake to uh, sort of give me something to copy. You know, it probably would have been better, like the first letter was probably better, where I, you know, they, they drew out my own thoughts. Right. And, um, but it is what it is, you know, you know, people do manipulate children from time to time. And this was one of them. And so I you know, carry on that subject. I, I was hoping to ask you, you know, you mentioned going into the National Committee to Secure Justice in the Rosenberg case. And I think in the years succeeding that, uh, there was kind of an image, especially in the popular media, that this committee was essentially like a kind of tightly run uh, Communist Party originated mm -hmm. operation that they were kind of, you know, manipulating you and putting you out out there. And I think what we, what Peter and I have found, at least in researching the first episodes of our series, is how much of this entire process was bottom up. And I know uh, Emily and David Allman, who founded it, were also neighbors of, of your parents, right? Yeah. Yeah. Although they hadn't met my folks. Uh, Emily met my mother once uh -huh. uh, after my father was arrested. Uh, she and uh, another mother were walking with a baby carriage, and my mother came along with Robbie in a baby carriage, probably me tagging along and after they exchanged a few words and moved on the woman said to emily that's ethel rosenberg her husband was arrested uh, clearly a, a pre-arranged communist party <laughs> brush pass uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Director yeah. from moscow yeah what's fascinating of course when you read exoneration is that um dave never jo dave joined the communist party and quit after the Nazi Soviet pact, right. Emily was one of these independent mavericks who not only never joined the Communist Party, but because she was outspoken against one of their policies, they expelled her from it anyway, even though she never had joined. <laughs> You're pre-expelled. <laughs> yeah. And um, the, the book makes it clear as talking about the seven people who were involved early on who said that... Um, you know, we're the worst people in the world to try to save the Rosenbergs. Unfortunately, there's nobody else. Uh, and they were all independent mavericks, you know. Um, and in fact, as you know, because you read the book, the Communist Party officially approached Dave Ullman directly and said, this committee should be disbanded. It's the wrong thing to do uh, in a revolution. Sometimes people have to be sacrificed. Yeah. Um, in fact, when my parents were sentenced to death, even though the Daily Worker had not covered it, they did run an editorial attacking the death penalty. Hmm. Their way of contributing something. Talking about about yeah, and then they, they stayed away from it and they opposed the formation of the committee. And uh, I, Emily and Dave talked to me about this many, many times. And, and independently, when Annie and I attended a wedding of one of my cousins, a very close friend gave me a hug and said, I knew your mother very well. And then she confided to my wife, which she wouldn't tell me, is that she was in the Communist Party. She was a very close friend of my mother's. And she was ordered by her Communist Party superiors to stay away from the case, to have nothing to do with the case after my parents were arrested. And she was so ashamed of it that she didn't want to tell me face to face. It, it seemed, I think of something else that we've kind of come across as, I don't know how to call it anything other than a, a vibe in the research was the extent to which we, the American public had this image of an aggressive, take no prisoners, solidly marching Communist Party and Soviet Union. And the image that we get, especially when you read Vasilius notebooks, the KGB agents own entries is of a, of a conservative, frankly, like scared and cautious. paranoid, cautious Communist Party that, while it did do espionage during the war was 
absolutely afraid of this connection being made between espionage and the wider communist movement. No question. No question. And in fact, I believe, I don't know if it was at a press conference or if it was actually in her trial, but Elizabeth Gurley Flynn mm -hmm. publicly stated, it may have been at her trial, we are patriotic Americans. We have nothing to do with spying. I mean, at least for her, that was true. Mm -hmm. She yeah. was... But she was yeah, national enough that she probably knew something. Oh yeah. Um, but to okay, so so you 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 have brought my memory back that I did try to play a mini role in uh, you know when I was a youngster, um, uh, and even when I was living with my grandmother in uh, uh, Manhattan, I remember taking leaflets and shoving it under people's doors mm -hmm. in buildings. Um, but that was a very small thing. Once once. Uh, you know, we were adopted by Anne and Abel Mirapol. We were out of the public eye and uh, guarded our anonymity very jealously and did nothing public. Uh, mm. In fact, we didn't do anything public on the, my parents' case till 1973. So mm. that's almost 20 years later. And but then, of course, you know, as you know from reading We Are Your Sons, we uh, threw ourselves uh, very deeply into it. Uh, a, a National Committee to reopen the Rosenberg case was formed in June 1974. We put together our book, We Are Your Sons. We, we became speakers. I took a year off from college without pay to uh, from my job, my day job without pay uh, to uh, go out on the road and, and make speeches and you know attend, attend rallies and events. And my brother did the same. He was in graduate school at the time. I wanted to ask you, in that kind of intervening period in between when you're involved in this case, it, it, I guess also during your this whole kind of drawn out process where you were taken away from the family and then eventually uh, uh, allowed to live with uh, Anne and Abel Mirapol, and this process where you and Robert come out of anonymity, in yeah. 73, what was your thinking about the case? Or was it something that you tried to leave behind? I, I mean, it you know, seems, seems I, like from I the book read, that you were still cons you know, reading uh, extensively into everything that was like published about the case, like John Wexley's book and so on. Okay, well, it, it, it's sort of like a half, half and half because um, I read the letters books, you know, those, those short paperback version of the letters books. Um, which, you know, we later learned that they had been heavily edited, uh -huh. sometimes changing the meaning of some of the, the letters, which, uh, you know, when we were working on the letters for We Are Your Sons, we were a bit shocked by that. Um, uh -huh. So I read those. I read in John Wexley's book, but as a teenager, remember, I was 13 when he wrote it. He came to the house. He gave us a copy. He said, this tells the story of well, how your parents are your parents' innocence. And I believed that, of course, from what they told me and what Anne and Abel always told me. And I was surrounded by people who believed that they were innocent and family members, you know, only the Rosenberg side of the family we kept in touch with, right. uh, never saw the green glasses again. And uh, we, um, uh, so I started to read it and it was a little tough going for a 13 year old. So I didn't read it. <laughs> and I didn't read anything about the case substantively until 1965 when Walter Miriam Schneer's book came out, which I read avidly. And, you know, it really taught me. I mean, I thought I knew the case then. Uh, it wasn't until Robbie and I came out in public in 1973 that I read the trial record and read all the letters. And then read the Wexley book. I had also read Virginia Gardner's hagiographic book, um, which, you know, didn't make much of an impression on me. It, it made much more an impression on me later on, looking backwards at it to, to identify the elements of hagiography. And as my brother says in my daughter Ivy's film, you know, people want to make them out to be devils or saints, but they're neither devils nor saints. Mm. So just for a, a little bit of clarity for the listener, uh, the Wexley, uh, can we just get a brief rundown sort of on who he yeah. was? John, he Wexley, was John Wexley uh, is a playwright, a well-known playwright, and he, he, he approached the, uh, the case as a drama. So he, mm -hmm. he introduces the case as characters, starts with Fuchs, then Gold, then the Green Glasses, then my parents. 
And reading the trial record and reading background material, uh, and remember, he had no access to any of the secret stuff that I did in the 1970s, uh, and he had no access to the gold tapes that Walter and Miriam Schneer had that, that indicated that Harry Gold was a, uh, committed a lot of perjury at the trial. Mm. Um, he did some very interesting textual analysis of the trial record, et cetera, and he made a strong case that at least there was something extraordinarily fishy about mm -hmm. the trial mm -hmm. and the case in general. Walter Miriam Schneer, obviously, with a lot of more information, did, I think, a fantastic job uh, of detective work. But as my brother points out, because he was the guy who went to law school, when you prove a frame up, that's not the same as proving that the person who was framed right. is innocent. That's right. It's interesting that, you know, the one of the first people to write about this case was a playwright because a lot of the people my age, I'm in my 30s, uh, who I know, who know about the case, if they're not already kind of committed, uh, you know, leftist or liberal political activist types, they know it from a play, namely Angels in America, which I think I might have mentioned in the first episode. Yes, um, absolutely. And you should, because it is something that has brought it back to America's consciousness. Although, I don't know if you guys have done a, a deep study in this. How many times do you think it gets mentioned casually in a TV series or in a movie? Mm -hmm. I got at least three examples. The, the Marvelous oh. Mrs. Maisel yeah. is very... Oh, I was sure. wondering no, no, if right, Maisel right, was right, going right, to be right, one right. because I watched a few episodes of it and that seemed like it might be... Right. It's right in the first episode. Oh, wow. Okay. I have to She's say that. stage and she goes raving about attacking conventional wisdom. And one mm -hmm. of her last lines is, the Rosenbergs were framed before she gets <laughs> pulled off the stage. That's great. Oh, man. But there's Cagney and Lacey, a Cagney and Lacey entry. And of course, there's Woody Allen in the movie Crimes and Misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. I hope you like a brother. <laughs> yep, yep. Everything that's going on out there, Jim Crow laws, voter fraud, you're taking the time to pick on a little lady? That's bullshit. This is Maisel. Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were framed. I, I, yeah, I was just kind of get, trying to get an idea of the evolution of your thinking. I know you've said before, uh, including to me, that you and your brother knew that before you went public that you were going to have to, to kind of become rigorously objective about this in a way that you hadn't had to before. Uh, yes, yeah, you're a thousand percent right. If we're out in public advocating for a position, we have to be bend over backwards to take seriously any and all arguments on the other side, which we did. And uh, that's why when Radoff and Stern published their article in The New Republic, where they accepted the uh, testimony of the jailhouse informer, a man named Jerome Eugene Tartico, whose stories to the FBI were released in one of the earliest releases by the FBI of their documents, and that would have been 1975. Uh, Rob and I had to, from the very beginning, confront the Tartico revelations because it basically, in the media, the media said, oh, well, now we know, you know, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were guilty. Here's a jailhouse former who, to whom Rosenberg confessed. And so this, we... Say, sorry yes. to interrupt. This was always a little bit of a surprising thing for me. And maybe by this point, it shouldn't be surprising because I kind of made a decision to not go too deep into Tarico in the podcast, just because as a lawyer, when I look at the reports of an informant that even the FBI labels his entries, Un informant of unknown reliability, right. even after he's made multiple reports, I think that I had to say, you know, they're really fishing here if they're thinking that this is the big piece of objective evidence, the hard evidence. But remember, I don't mean to be nasty. Case. But just remember, journalists have the attention span of two-year-olds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so they seized on it and they just, they ran with it. What I was most upset with was I considered that Radosh and Milton and Radosh and Stern originally were too uncritical about Tartico. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they could have, maybe they just didn't think they could get it published. 
they could have written a, on the one hand, on the other hand book, which said, you know, there's a lot of open questions about this case. It's not an obvious case that they're innocent just because of the misbehavior of the prosecution. Here's some strong evidence on the other side. And as good historians, we have to admit, we're just not sure. But I think, you know, this is my reading into the motives. And of course, you don't know about motives. I think they basically wanted to make money. And so they wanted a, a splash. They wanted a book that would be a, a smash hit. And it was. I mean, it, right. it is still considered the definitive treatment uh, by the American historical uh, profession. And I mean, kind of the, uh, the it, it's funny, each of these kind of big books that comes out about the case seems to have as, as the, the crux of it, the, the big headline selling point that they have unearthed a, a new bit of evidence or a new bit of corroboration. With Ronald Radosh, it was his attempt to, and, and Sol Stern, I guess, I, although I'm, I'm a little confused as to why Sol Stern fell off and, and Joyce Milton. Well, came. here's the reason, I can tell you the reason. Sol Stern was a journalist who helped con uh, conduct some of the interviews. Mm -hmm. But when the time came to have a book contract, uh, so my I'm understanding right. is that the publisher wanted a professional writer mm -hmm. to work with Ronald Radosh. That makes sense. And the reason I think I know this is that a guy named Stanley Cutler, a history professor at UMA at uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, where Ronald Radosh got his PhD, knew him. And he, he, he had me come and speak there. Uh, Stan Cutler, and he had me come and speak there, and uh, he told me later on that uh, he believes that uh, that was that was the basis of that collaboration because Joyce Milton was significantly younger than Ronald Radosh. She's even younger than me, although she died prematurely. And so I don't think they had they knew each other until uh, you know the publisher brought them together. I, I guess the reason I ask is because in that uh, in that first collaboration with Radosh and Saul Stern, where they published that article in 1979, it's it seems a, a bit more of that on the one hand than the other hand. Than my impression, Rosenberg. my impression exactly, which was why the Radosh Milton book blew me away when I when I got a set of galleys of it. I as mean, you know specifically from... that that original Saul Stern Ronald Radosh article. It's based on the same interview material theoretically, but they say, OK, it is pretty fishy that a week before the trial, the FBI arranges through these interviews witnesses to kind of generate this story that Ethel yeah. Rosenberg typed out notes and actually did a physical overt act as yeah. a part of this conspiracy. Yeah. And uh, in the later Rosenberg file book, there's there's no question of any of the stories. Well, in the book, they're still willing to acknowledge that, uh, you know, the, the typing story may not have happened. The, the book, remember, is written before David Greenglass admits that it was a perjury. Although didn't they, uh, didn't they bring back the console table story? They felt that the console table story actually redounded against my parents. Mm. And uh, uh, just to illustrate the this, three a holes. Little bit, yeah, for the there were no explanation for the three holes. The yeah, uh, I'm a little obsessed with this piece of evidence, which kind of gets a like a, a sentence here and a sentence there these days in, in talking about the case. But at the trial, David Greenglass test and well, and more specifically, Ruth Greenglass testified yes. that your parents had a console table that was retrofitted with a, a, a space, what police like to call a void, where a light goes uh, so that you could kind of place images or, or pieces of paper in front of it and under better lighting conditions, mount a camera mm. onto the console table and take pictures with a Leica camera or some such mm -hmm. thing. Uh, yeah. It was basically a, a, a spy console table. Yes. Yeah, and, and what Radosh and Milton argued is that the three holes in the table uh, could not be explained. If the table had been produced, it would have been very hard to explain the three holes without at least giving some credence to the idea that it had, it had been altered for photography. Now, my father wrote a letter to Manny Block describing how come he drilled the three holes. And then the National Guardian reporter Leon Summit supposedly got uh, Mrs. Evelyn Cox to say, those are the three holes I saw Mr. Rosenberg drill. But, you know, who knows? 
I mean, this is one piece of evidence, if I'm not mistaken, where you actually saw the table. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it definitely did not have a hollow, hollowed out section underneath it for microfilming. But I, <laughs> I, when I saw the table as a kid, I never noticed the holes. And there's a there's just a, a kind of a one sentence disposal of the console table issue in Sam Roberts is the brother where he interviews David Greenglass and says, David now admits he lied about seeing the console table in the Rosenberg's apartment. And that's that's it. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Jesus. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I read Roberts's book very carefully and I don't remember that. How do you like that? <laughs> just it's just a one sentence in passing in, in the paragraph. Yeah. So to go back to the issue, Rob and I believed that we, by proving how the prosecution case is built on a tissue of lies, that proves that they're innocent. But of course, it doesn't. Right. It just proves that the government and the green glasses, and, and you could actually say that the green glasses hoodwinked the government on this. Uh, they made up stuff to reduce their guilt and increase the guilt of my father and create the guilt of my mother. Um, because that was what they were pressured to do. Um, and in effect, you were framing a guilty man, my father, and you were framing an innocent woman, my mother. Uh, but that's different from what we believed. We believed that we had proved that they were innocent and we believed that they were innocent. And then, you know, Tartico comes along and we're not convinced by Tartico. We think we have refuted Tartico's story. Ray Dosh and Milton come along and we think that we've demonstrated that their book is a lousy book. Uh, and then Venona is released. And there, if you read some of the stuff we said, we were kind of in, uh, on the one hand, on the other hand. And that we were stuck with that from 1995 until Morty Sobel gave his interview to Sam Roberts, where he said, yeah, you can call it that. We were spies. And then we had no reason to disbelieve Morty. And on some level, this may sound a little surprising. I think we were happy. I think we were happier to be certain than to have the uncertainty that we had, the agnosticism that we had from the period from Venona in 1995 to 2000, whenever it was, 2008, when, when Morty spoke to Sam Robert. And as you mentioned, uh, when, when Venona came out, you, you, and your brother started going on the one hand, on the other hand, with this new bit of evidence where individual entries seem to track along with some of the trial testimony, at least. And if your father was this person codenamed liberal, then he was doing some kind of espionage. Yes. Um, but to kind of take back to the thinking of that time, because I think from this kind of hindsight, it's, it's very easy for people to think, well, I mean, why would you think that when these when these come out, you found entries in Venona at the time that at least in the way that they were translated, because you're doing like layers of hearsay. Yeah. Didn't make a whole lot of sense with your experience. And I, I read one, uh, one in particular said your father was delivered uh, in 1945, $4,000 and your household at the time, the apartment you were living in, state of your father's business was not at all reflecting that. Well, it was even worse than that. I mean, my father could not have inve in um, uh, invented this. It was 1950 or 1949. He comes home from a day at the shop. He says, I saw my first $50 bill today. Mm -hmm. Now, it's conceivable the Soviets gave them $4,000 in only 20s. It's certainly <laughs> conceivable. But my guess is that he would not be making that up to my mother who would have known about the $4,000. Right. Uh, and of course we clamored to see it. He said, Oh, I gave it to Dave shine. There was a silent partner who had lent them money and <laughs> they were paying him off, you know, yeah. very slowly. <laughs> so that I remember that $4,000 thing just did not seem right. Now here's a question. Is there an equivalent in Vasiliev's notebooks? I have not found it. No. That's the thing. When Venona and Vasiliev's notebooks diverge, then you got to wonder if there's a mistranslation or Robbie and I, of course, suspected that they had maybe been adding things to Venona after 1975 when we filed our Freedom of Information Act lawsuit. And they assumed that sooner or later that stuff would come out. But, right. you know, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe it's all, you know, just, you know, 
varieties of translation. So I think I've basically explained the sort of trajectory of my brothers and my opinions about this. Right. Um, and one of the things that happened is that once The Haunted Wood came out and Vasiliev's Notebooks came out, and it validated enough of Venona for us to say, okay, Venona is not 100% disinformation. There may be some uncertainties there, but it's, it's basically telling the story. Um, then all of a sudden, Tartico becomes the FBI's way of getting Venona information onto the public record so that they don't have to reveal Venona. If they have Tartico coming in and testifying against William Pearl, then they don't need Venona to testify against William Pearl. And that explains Tartico's role. Whereas before it was unclear, why would the FBI fill Tartico with all this garbage? Well, the answer is because they got it from Venona. And it's a, it's a classic role of an informant to do what they call parallel construction. You can't get a search warrant on the place that you've already searched. So you invent an informant saying that there were drugs in the apartment. This is where your hat as a lawyer and if, and particularly public defender comes in very, very handy. So one thing I wanted to ask you about, if you could kind of elaborate for us, is it's not as though these releases happen out of the generosity of the FBI. Although obviously later on with Venona and Vasilia's notebooks, those kind of end up being the government's declaration of we got things at least mostly right. You can be quiet now. But you and your brother and uh, Marshall Perlin, I know, actually had to fight for, for years for these documents. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. This is what happened. We, we determined to use the FOIA as soon as uh, Congress expanded it over Gerald Ford's veto in the wake of Watergate. And that's the Freedom of Information Act, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so we had planned to do that you know, probably almost from the get-go, from the minute that the National Committee to Reopen the Rosenberg case was launched in June of 1974, we had that planned and we determined to do it. And we filed that request with the government in February, 1975. And then, you know, they went through all the shenanigans of delay and delay and delay. And finally, but the law requires them to say, you may consider this a refusal and you now have the right to sue in federal district court, which we did. We filed a lawsuit, which was Mirapol v. Levy, because Levy was the attorney general at the time. By the time a final judgment was entered, it was the middle of the Reagan administration and it shows up in the, um, in the legal lexicon as Mirapol v. Mies. Uh, a final judgment was issued by an appeals court, by the way, that included Robert Bork. It might've even included Scalia. I'm not sure if Scalia was on the panel with Bork, but Bork was certainly on the panel. And uh, they have a full accounting of how many pages were released, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they say the, the government has done enough. You don't, you don't, you're not entitled to any more. And we didn't, we didn't appeal, you know. Yeah, Peter and I had a chance, we were recording yesterday to look at some of the documents that were released. And uh, got to say, the FBI, are, are, are when they're releasing documents they don't want, they're not studious about copying them in a legible way. <laughs> no. You got that. Uh, blurred, out, uh, blurred out stuff all over the place. And we're not talking about redactions. We're just talking about, I, uh, I sit on the copier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and so, the, so the first release in 1975 actually had a couple of, uh, you know, really big deals, like the fact that uh, in the in the run through before the grand jury testimony, the grand jury stuff wasn't released until very recently. Mm -hmm. But in the run through before the grand jury where, you know, uh, assistant U.S. attorney, um, assistant attorney general Miles Lane, who was on the prosecution team, um, puts both Greenglass and Gold through their paces. And Greenglass denies, the same that was in, my, Greenglass denies that my mother was involved and he was under oath just like he was before the grand jury. And so we we publicized that. And of course, Harry Gold had a different code name. You know, I'm not code name, a different signal. It wasn't I come from Julius. It was I bring greetings from Ben in Brooklyn. Right. You know, and so now both of those were, you know, like giant beacons and we publicized them immediately. And then very soon after that, the Tartico stuff is released and that's the beginning of a, a long 
drag about dealing with Tartico, uh, which culminates, of course, in the Radosh and Stern article in 1979 and the Radosh and Milton book in 1983. Yeah, and, and just to clarify for our listeners, Jerome Tartico was a cooperating informant that was in the jail with Julius Rosenberg and was claiming that through his kind of working class background and vaguely communist party connections with Eugene Dennis, that Julius uh, was willingly just kind of uh, bragging about various spy capers he was involved in and uh, giving uh, numerous details that he thought that he claimed only could have come from Julius. And it, it sounds like now, especially since so much of Tartico's material was about building cases on other people, the FBI suspected of being involved with Julius, mm. that he was a, a kind of a parallel construction uh, stool pigeon, a figure that was fed a little bit of information and then could could hear the melody and play along with the rest. I think that's right. I absolutely think that's right. And and the fact that the all the information that Tartico gave was available in Venona. Uh, means that the FBI had the ability to suggest things to Tartico, whereas in the pre-Venona era, we, we were faced with a situation, you know, uh, yeah, why would the FBI feed Tartico all this nonsense? Um, you know, well, now we know, because it, some of it, a lot of it wasn't nonsense. I, I think one of the things that that at least I kind of got from reading We Are Your Sons is that when the FBI documents and other information was getting released to you and your brother in the 70s, that you really got a sense of Judge Kaufman's role. Oh my God. A very oh different God. sense of kind of who was responsible for your parents' death and in particular Ethel. Yeah, I mean. What was your kind of revelations or evolution of your thinking about Judge Kaufman and his role in the case, because at least for me as as an attorney, it was pretty uh, pretty mind blowing how much he tried to intervene at every stage and seemed to hope to get a Supreme Court position out of this eventually. Yeah, which in fact, you know, ironically, it probably was the reason he didn't get the Jewish seat on the Supreme Court. Mm. Yes, literally that that allocated wow. Jewish seat. Um, <sighs> That time anyway, um, uh, we always believed that Kaufman had been grossly unfair. We thought that his sentencing speech was an abomination, and we really hated the fact that he accused my parents of loving communism more than Robbie and me, which was you know absolutely disgusting. But we didn't know any of the things that were revealed when the FBI documents came out and we came across the Kaufman papers. We had no idea all the stuff we would discover when the FBI files were released, which we ended up publishing as the Kaufman papers. And then I used them and even documents that weren't in the original Kaufman papers that we put into the congressional record. I was able, I just really enjoyed writing that chapter in uh, We Are Your Son's second edition called He Talked to the Judge, where I just go through all of those documents to show the kinds of things Kaufman did. I think at least one case, he committed the crime of obstruction of justice when um, he raised hell with Thurgood Marshall about question he had asked on a Morton Sobel appeal on uh, the Griswold precedent. Uh, Grunwald, not Griswold. Yeah, I was about to say, I didn't think it was Griswold versus Connecticut, but it wasn't going to yeah, yeah, Griswold versus Connecticut. Yeah, that's in the news a lot. No, but yeah, the, the Grunwald, Grunwald precedent, which I um, I had I had the uh, I was able to. Uh, you know, I use the exact wording of the Supreme Court decision, uh, which actually, I didn't realize this, it was questioning of a different defendant. It wasn't Grunwald who got that questioning, it was somebody else. But the, the his counsel objected strenuously to being questioned about taking the Fifth Amendment before the grand jury. Mm -hmm. And um, the Supreme Court ruled that that was reversible error. The judge should never have permitted that questioning. Well, in my mother's case, it was not just the prosecutor asking questions. It was the judge asking those bloody questions. So it's I really. About, oh, I mean, why would you take the Fifth Amendment here? Yeah. Yeah. What has changed since being before the grand jury? And by the way, Manny Block, for all his failures, 
he posed the objection that ultimately was what the Supreme Court agreed with. He said, there's a big difference between the grand jury and the trial. The grand jury, you're compelled to testify, testify under subpoena without the presence of an attorney. The witness has voluntarily taken the stand here and she had no, she didn't have to take the stand. Uh, and that is the big difference. And Kaufman couldn't respond to him. He just ignored I think, uh, not to get too much in the legal weeds, one of the things that came up when I, I read a paper called Taking uh, Great Cases um, about your parents' case was the amount of, the number of Supreme Court justices that thought that this was similar in this uh, very specific way to the Tom Mooney case, where yes. if, there's, if there's proof that a prosecutor uh, procured the perjury of one of their witnesses, yeah. then that is reversible error. But yeah. being essentially just afraid at the time of yeah. the consequences, and actually it, it turned out a lot of the Supreme Court justices were being tailed by the FBI at the time of this appeal, wow. revealed by a book named Cloaking Gavel, I think it is, wow. uh, that they just didn't take it. Yeah. Well, I think Fred Vinson, uh, Fred Vinson was, you know, he had been a former uh, attorney general, and he was very big in the original uh, loyalty program that Truman created. And, uh, you know, I think Vinson and a number of the other justices who were, by the way, called Harry Truman's law firm, yes. um, they didn't want to touch it politically. And, you know, I talked to one of uh, William Douglas's wives who, you know, was very young when he married her. This is not Kathy Douglas. This is a different one. Um, and she told me over the phone that uh, uh, Douglas, and I didn't like the language she used, that Douglas told her that the chief justice told me they've got to fry. Jeez. Although I feel like that's, I mean, it's disgusting language, but I feel like it's consistent with what Vincent has said on other occasions. Yeah. Oh, Lord. So sorry, I'm going to pause for a second on that dark note. That was okay. That was worth a pause. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you think you live in a society of laws and then the people, very people doing the most to uphold that image of, of what we have provide these exceptions. Yeah, yeah. You know, maybe on a, a note that's related to the case, but it's not quite on it. Uh, it it's and, and in fact, it goes much deeper than that, because in the post Venona period, you get the book by this guy, Jonathan Blum in the enemy's house which I assume you've read. Um, he worked with, uh, I think, Gardner's family and with Lam Fear directly, and he looked at Gardner's papers. And that's the and, FBI agent, uh, Robert yeah, Lamphere. Robert Lamphere was the FBI liaison with Meredith Gardner, who was the chief linguist on the Venona project. Um, and the two of them together, according to Blum, and I think maybe Blum's exaggerating, were very regretful about my mother's sentence of death and that this, the sentence was carried out because they knew from their own work with the documents that my mother never had a code name. And there's even a well-known memo by Gardner, which I'm sure you've seen, where he explains that the Russian word rabotya, uh, which uh, is translated into Venona as does not work, refers to spying not to a job outside the home. Right, and that was the translator's note on that particular cable, right? Yeah, it was his note. The Freedom of Information Act, in my opinion, is a great law. And I think the leadership of our government, Carter's Justice Department, the FBI, etc., are really not interested in being open and being accountable to the people. I mean, they talk a lot about it. They talk a good game, but when push comes to shove, they would really like to be able to do things on their own without people looking over their shoulder. And with the Freedom of Information Act, there's a collective nation looking over the shoulder of any government official.
and in fact that that leads us to uh i don't know if you, you you're going to be able to edit this so we might as well jump because i you know sure. I, yeah. my mind does this a lot I do it all the time uh, my brother and i have a foia request pending with the national security agency just because when they released Fenona, they said this is it these are all the transcripts and so we didn't we didn't you know file a new request to get you know everything uh but then the fact that one of gardner's notes was also released i think it's the only one that specifically addresses the issue Robocha and my mother and why 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 the line does not work should be translated into is not a spy um we surmised that you know if there's one note there might be a whole bunch of those notes right and we want to refile our request for an exoneration of our mother uh, but there doesn't seem to be any good time you know we can't his my brother's version of this is we can't get a word in edgewise what with january 6th and ukraine and this that and the other thing and he has an example i assume you know this when the family of robert j oppenheimer supported by four u.s senators yeah. asked that his security clearance be posthumously restored and that he be exonerated of the kind of charges that led to his security clearance being pulled. Uh, the response from uh, the uh, Biden administration was crickets. Uh, and this was with a lot of publicity and four senators. It disappeared from the public pages. We'll and see what happens it, when the movie comes out, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, really the problem is that there's too many other things going on. And so my brother and I are not in a position to make a request to Biden. We don't know when we will, but we certainly don't want all the people that, you know, are sort of wondering when we're going to do it to think we're doing nothing. So this FOIA request is really an effort to see who knows. There may be more handwritten stuff that will help us make our case even stronger. And so to, to kind of clarify this or, or put a bow on it right now, the well, in the in the mid 90s, the NSA and basically as a successor agency to the actual army uh, intelligence corps that did the translations or did the, the cable translations. The decryption. Made, decryption, decryption, sorry. Um, well, decryption entrances, but. And translate, yeah. Uh, they released this, uh, these Venona cables and some of them are accessible online. And each one, of course, the, a decryption analyst who also is acting as a Russian translator goes over it and makes notes. And only a few of the notes related to your, your parents' case were actually released. In fact, yep. you said, if you said this right, only one of the notes. Oh, I thought there was only one that specifically related to my mother. Yes. And clearly if there's more cables and more decryptions that happen in this era, and I think I talked with Peter about this, they were doing decryptions for a period of about 20 years or more. Yep, yep. Going back over these cables over and over again. Yeah. Uh, even though the codes had long since changed. Mm. Yeah. If there are other notes, those could be, and frankly, at this point, I, my suspicion is, are exculpatory, tend towards showing that she wasn't doing this kind of work, particularly and when- And that Gardner was sure she wasn't. Right. And I mean, th this kind of gets to something that I've seen developing but is seemingly hard for people to accept about this case which is julius your father was involved in espionage he did it in this entire political milieu and volunteered for it. he wasn't simply a, a pawn but as far as we can get to proving the negative or affirmative evidence of innocence mm -hmm. The evidence that's come out since the 90s has shown that Ethel was not involved with any overt act. Yeah, although although to give them their due, the other side has been scrambling for a whole bunch of things. For example, mm -hmm. supposedly Fiklisov, one of Fiklisov's statements is that she was used as a cutout. Uh, she, it, it, he was supposed to go to a local uh eatery and it, it was a yeah sort of a soda fountain called the k and k which was actually located at the corner of monroe street and i don't remember the other street but it was at the corner 
away from the East River in Forty Monroe, which was the other set of buildings. And it used to be a lot of fun for me to go through the cellars of Monroe Street <laughs> all the way to the K and K and get in through the back door from the building without ever going out on the street. And allegedly, if she was there, then Fakita the would know it was safe for him to go up to the apartment. If she was not there, then it wasn't safe. And then when he saw her there, he then reports that that's how he went to the apartment. And this becomes to Austin and some other people evidence that she was a witting, active participant in the conspiracy. Mm, might be good to talk about who Klikov is. Or, or, or Feklisov? Feklisov. Yeah. Oh, so, so Feklisov. Feklisov is my father's uh, contact after the original contact. I see. Okay. And he, he's the guy who gets the proximity fuse. He's the guy who gives a handbag as a gift to my mother. He's mm-hmm. the guy who came back to the States later and, you know, made speeches and wrote a book, The Man Behind the Rosenbergs. Mm-hmm. And he was quoted as saying that, you know, my mother was, had, was nothing. She was just, you know, uh-huh. Lib- Libby's wife. Right. When did, when did he come back to, when did he come back to the States? Ah. In the, it was in the in, 90s. in, in the okay. 80s, so before post- Venona, 80s. in right. like 1990, maybe. Yeah, so so immediately after the fall of Berlin Wall. Right. Okay, interesting. Thank you. And of course, my brother and I were skeptical about him. Even after Venona, we were skeptical about him. Mm-hmm. You know, he's the age KGB agent telling war stories, looking to get paid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see being skeptical about him. I, I watched the interview with that he did for I think it was 60 minutes and basically they ask a question and he's kind of nods up a little bit and he looks down at what might be a, like a crib sheet or something like that he goes oh yeah this is what happened very slowly yeah well Walter Schneer interviewed him at length mm-hmm. and he, he and his wife and he said that he couldn't tell what Fiklisov was saying that was based on him having studied the trial transcript and written materials that were produced long after the trial, and what was something that he was remembering on his own. And Walter, in effect, said, we gave up, we could not figure out, we couldn't figure out a way to, to find out if he was really remembering things from what he did or just restating things that he had learned since. Uh, but this was and maybe by that Walter, point he didn't know. Like this was before Walter uh, read the Haunted Wood. Mm-hmm. Once Walter read the Haunted Wood, he, uh, in fact, he was convinced by Venona, as mm-hmm. you know. One of the things that we kind of talked about contextually, we kind of marvel at it, is the degree to which this case and others were kind of the severing or destruction of a whole of a whole world, a whole milieu uh, on the left. Um, from the 30s through the late 40s and into the early 50s. And I know that when you kind of made, had your own uh, encounter and, and, and you and your brother Robbie were involved in the uh, New Left and in SDS in the 60s, you were, you were in a very different political now. You were in very different politics mm-hmm. than that of, say, your, your parents or... Oh, absolutely, yeah. And so did you want to talk a bit about that? Well, um, Robbie does a much better job because he was uh, when he was at Michigan, it was in at the height of the uh, the 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 60s. I mean, you know, it's funny about the 60s Um, when you say the 60s, it really doesn't begin till 1965. Right. And it sort of goes to, I don't know, maybe 70. I mean, that's the that's the most intense period. When the Black Panthers are getting murdered and students are getting shot at Kent State and there are demonstrations and ROTC buildings are being uh, burned and draft resistance is high. There's GI resistance to the war. And by the 70s, there's GI resistance during the war. Um, You could say that, you know, it sort of ends when, you know, the last uh, helicopter lifts off the roof in Saigon in 1975. Robbie was in college. And, and graduate school at the University of Michigan uh, in that period. And <laughs> I was- uh, Quiet you know, campus, no, no, no uneventful. <laughs> I was at the University of Wisconsin from 66 to 68, but I, I was, you know, 
doing my graduate work and uh, you know, the, the most intense demonstrations occurred after I left in, uh, in, in 1970. And it was the, 1970 was the year that the campus really exploded and there was mm -hmm. the actual literal explosion at yeah. the Army Math Research Center. Right. Um, and I participated in demonstrations, but I, I never got arrested. Uh, I only time I got arrested was a, a mistake in uh, K, uh, uh, Chester, Pennsylvania, when I was at Swarthmore, when uh, a bunch of us were blockading a building and there were pickets who weren't blockading the building and the cops made no distinction. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I was, I was, you know, very tame. You know, I wrote letters to the editor. I would called up talk radio shows. Um, my brother was active. My brother got arrested. He had to serve his sentence, clearing brush from the sidewalk. He participated in demonstrations where it was possibly that there would be real violence. Um, and he describes it very, very dramatically in, in both his books. Yes. Um, to me, um, the left was argument, trying to prove my case, trying to prove that my side is rational. <laughs> and I spent my entire teaching career doing that as well. Um, it's just just my my nature. And maybe maybe it's a little bit of, you know, fear, you know, not having the courage of other people. I've certainly said that I certainly could have done more to try and end the war and to uh, uh, improve uh, the United States. I, I didn't do zero, but I certainly could have done more. What I found myself thinking um, was that you went through this, your, your parents' case and all of the information around it so methodically, so rationally, taking the other side's arguments so seriously, you know, it's, that's so uncommon that uh, people on the internet, people, you know, uh, roughly my age came up with a neologism for it, which is steel manning, right? Okay. The opposite of straw manning. So you could, oh, you could say- I you like that line. Yeah, you could say you were steel manning avant la lettre and, you know, not necessarily the sort of house style of the new left, right? You, you obviously had some rational people and people who made good arguments for things, but the sort of uh, classical style of the new left was, the, was quite impassioned, uh, feverish almost in some cases. And, you know, I don't think you should see yourself, I think you've done something very courageous uh, by uh, going the way that you did. And I think if there's anything there, and, and obviously I'm a newcomer to this case, I'm not you, uh, mm -hmm. so, so you would be the one to say, but a, a passion, a, a very dark passion created this case. You know, uh, Isaac and I were talking about this fever that seemed to come over the United States. We were talking about the peak skill riots, yep. uh, the beginning of this anti-communist passion and people railroading uh, your parents on that basis with the most, you know, motivated, uh, it's, it, you almost don't want to call it motivated reasoning, but, you know, something like motivated reasoning uh, that, that they could have possibly done. So I think it makes a lot of sense that you would want to undo that and do something different from that, even if it wasn't what others in the new left milieu were doing. And it, I think, you know, the, the history, you know, of the lab, uh, of, of the historiography since then has kind of vindicated your method. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I and, and long, even before Robbie and I came out, when I was a graduate student at Wisconsin, I actually, um, uh, wrote a, a, a couple of pieces for the Daily Cardinal, which was the, uh, the, the student-run newspaper, which was very good, by the way, very mm -hmm. good and, and quite left-wing. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be a columnist. And mm -hmm. I said, my column would be called Radicalism is Rational. Mm -hmm. And I, I wrote a couple of sample columns and <laughs> of course they rejected it. <laughs> they weren't very dramatic, you know, but right. that turned out to be my my MO when I, when I entered the classroom as a faculty member teaching economics, you know, you teach economics, I'm a, you know, I guess I'm a Marxist economist, but I had to teach traditional economics. So what did I do? Sure. I taught them both. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, the students learned that there was radical alternatives mm -hmm. and then they got the traditional stuff as well. And my goal in class was to get them to argue. And I would say, 
you better not just re 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 replicate what I write, what, what I say in class on an exam, because I'm going to give you a C minus and say, where are the counter arguments? <laughs> and if <laughs> you great. disagree with me, that's fine. I just want to hear why. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I wouldn't even tell them what I thought. I would just, you know, play devil's advocate and, mm. and talk about this, that, and the other. They knew who I was pretty soon. You know? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the great. point was, I would conduct my classroom in a way that I, you know, wanted them to voice their opinions and then defend them. That was, and my argument was, that's how you learn. You learn by exercising the muscle in the brain. Absolutely. So that was, I mean, that was my MO in the classroom and it was my MO when I became a public Rosen. Okay, now here's here's a question. Oh, yeah. I by all means, if you had a question for us, like, did you Did you want to specifically get into the nature of our request to Obama to exonerate our mother? Or no, let's get into it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, tell us all about it. Well, right away in 1975, it became possible to see that Certainly, there was a lot of evidence that she was framed. Um, not so much about my father. And as you remembered, when Radosh and Stern wrote their article for the Re New Republic, they called it the Hidden Rosenberg case. And there were two pictures. Julius was guilty. Ethel was framed. And we thought that, uh, you know, the, Ray the Rosenberg file, which was the book length treatment, would um, in effect um, split the difference. And so we were kind of horrified where they said, my mother was obviously guilty anyway, even though the typing story may or may not be true. Uh, but we had in the back of our mind that, you know, there's a possibility that, uh, you know, we could really make a case for our mother, even if we couldn't make a stronger case for our father. But of course, at that time, this was pre Venona and uh, pre Morty Sobel talking. We didn't, and, and my brother was more interested in exploring this, but most of the people around us, including our lawyer, Marshall Perlin, said, no, no, you really have to keep them together. You don't want to create a situation where by emphasizing your mother, you start to acknowledge that your father was guilty. Um, well, it turns out that that was the case. So when Morton Sobel came out in public and said, yeah, I was doing these stuff with my father, and then that vindicated Venona, and then, of course, Vasiliev's notebooks were released around the same time. It's very interesting. Venona is 1995 and The Haunted Wood is published in 1999. But Vasiliev's notebooks don't go online till 2008. And I think that only happened because of a, a lawsuit he was involved in with John Lowenthal, Alger Hiss's former lawyer, right? Uh -huh. Interesting. I, I, you know, I don't know anything about that, but I... I do know that that and the grand jury release, which really nailed down what we think is strong evidence that my mother was not involved at all. And, and, and for good reason. If my father's risking his freedom and potentially his life uh, helping the Soviets during World War II, who's going to take care of us? Well, she stays out of it. And she now is the person who could take care of us if, if he got arrested. And of course, they never, never thought that he would get the death penalty um, until, you know, when he was ultimately arrested and it was clear that he faced the death penalty. Then that was a real issue. And then, of course, my mother's arrest. I don't know if it surprised them or not. My mother feared that she would be arrested. There's one letter that she wrote of I didn't have a chance to make arrangements for the children in case I were detained, which meant that even before she was before the grand jury, she thought she might be arrested. Yeah. Anyway, so after that, it, it's clear from all the evidence that my mother's innocent. So we and we had a model in 1977, the governor of Massachusetts, Michael Dukakis and Robbie and I were Massachusetts residents for many, many years. Uh, issued this, a is a, this is a hard Massachusetts podcast. So That's right. We, we acknowledge and salute you for being at least former Massachusetts residents. Yes, indeed. So. In 1977, he issues a proclamation saying that from now on, we should not think that there's any taint of guilt attached to Sacco Vanzetti because of a whole variety of things. And in effect, he proclaimed that the trial you know, was, was a travesty, that the case was uh, riddled with judicial error and judicial misconduct on the part of the trial judge, and therefore all taint of guilt should be removed from the memory of these two people. And one of the Sacco grandsons was there 
at the time that um, Dukakis made the announcement, his first name was Spencer. Um, and Dukakis later gave the proclamation to my brother when they met, and that was later on, like in the 1990s. And so we used that as our model. And when we made the request to Obama, Mike Dukakis signed on. I was on the phone with, well, you know, Mike Dukakis went to Swarthmore also. So we had that in common. I was on the phone with him and he signed on and he actually reached out to Sally Yates of the Justice Department to find out what happened to the request. And he never got a, a, an adequate answer. Um, so we file all this material with um, uh, um, Valerie Jarrett the, wanting her to get it in front of Obama. We sent it by registered mail to the White House and we know somebody signed for it. Um, and then we were on 60 Minutes at the same time. We got 55,000 signatures uh, in support of our effort. We had the members of the New York City Council issuing a proclamation that our mother should be exonerated. All of this combined. And uh, we think that the election of Trump so traumatized the Obama White House that we're, we are doubtful Obama ever even saw it. I mean, you figure as a fellow Marxist. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there you go. There you go. With an anti-colonial bent. Yes. <laughs> anyway, we, we we think we moved the needle because of the 60 Minutes broadcast and right. the mm -hmm. fact that there were so many people who supported us publicly. Some of our some members of Congress, members of the Massachusetts delegation, wrote officially to Obama saying this should be considered. I think Senator Warren said the same huh. thing. Yeah. Uh, my brother's met rep, Jim McGovern. Yep. I think it's my brother's rep. I'm not sure. Yeah. Was very strong. Was probably the strongest office in support of our effort. That sounds like him. Anyway, we did it. Obama ignored us. Trump came into the White House. And uh, when Biden was elected, we said we should do it again. But we, we, we haven't done it yet because, as I said earlier, we, we can't get a word in edgewise. But we think that that's at least the American government should do that for God's sake, because yeah. it's so straightforward. The, the, the two guys who did the FBI stuff on liaison with Venona and the, the linguist, uh, Meredith Gardner, they both felt that it was a horrible injustice that she was killed. Um, and that's one of the themes of this book by this guy, Jonathan Blum in the enemy's house about their efforts to you know decipher the Venona decrypts and figure out how to tr translate them from code into words, first Russian words and then English words. Um, and, you know, Gardner was give the information to Le uh, um, um, Lamphere and Lamphere would try to translate it into the FBI investigations. And there's an absolutely revelatory um, FBI document that was published the very day David Greenglass is arrested, which says, David Greenglass is caliber and Julius Rosenberg is liberal. And, you know, some of these translations actually turn out to be some of the most powerful pieces of evidence that are in the petition to exonerate Ethel that I've read through. Namely, the, the KGB never gave her a code name. Yep. And it's not just that she is mentioned and then later given a code name, like, say, Ruth Greenglass, who gets right. lost. I'm noticing coming through these notebooks and uh, cables that if the KGB or at the time NKGB even considers you a, a prospective asset or agent or cutout, they give you a code name preemptively. So preemptively, before, yeah. Before Ruth Greenglass ever uh, entreaties David into uh, pilfering or memorizing information from Los Alamos, he's given the code name Bumblebee. Ah. Uh, and then when they're talking about whether David could talk to some of his old contacts at Los Alamos that are now at U Chicago, they immediately give all three of them code names. Uh -huh. But Ethel is always Ethel or liberal's wife. Liberal's wife. Yeah. And uh, yeah. of course, yeah, I think that's to know that she does not work due to her poor health, which was a very real thing. Yeah. There's no question. She had, she, she had poor health, but um, uh, that was not the reason. I mean, you know, you can be a spy sitting at a, at a table typing. Yep. You know, you don't you don't have to not spy because of poor health. But the fact remains that um, it was probably that might have been an excuse that dad gave to Fiklisov 
because they wanted her to be safe, to take care of Robbie and me in case anything happened. Each and, of those and entries seems to reassure the KGB that she is, you know, of a good political development. Good political, I, yes. I, I won't go to the police. <laughs> right. Knows, knows of her husband's work. Uh, but as we know, and by the way, Robbie and I have this fight with people, even lawyers every once in a while. Knowledge of a conspiracy is not participation in the conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, a lot of these conspiracy cases that are actually done, and maybe I'll cut this, but there's not a lot of, say, mobsters' wives who are in jail or in federal yeah. prison or executed. Every, or executed every time one of them goes to jail. But they don't participate. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm gonna I'm going to uh, subscribe because right. I want to hear. Awesome. I don't I don't want to just hear the thing you do about my parents. I want to hear other stuff. Um, we should be putting out a bonus episode. I've recorded it, but I'm gonna edit it because it's a little shaky um, mm. about Ted Hall. Uh -huh. um, it's a quick episode. Well, do you know that there's a there's a documentary that's going to drop about Ted Hall? Um, a kind of a what would you call it, internet acquaintance mm. uh, that Peter and I both know did an interview pretty recently with Dave Lindorf about Ted Hall and Klaus Fuchs. So um, that's good because I have been in touch with Dave. Dave actually has a book he's trying to get published. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, that Dave's, it, it, let me tell you a little bit about this because you know, Rob, uh, Annie and I visited with Ted and Joan Hall and yes. one of their daughters. No, yeah, just before he died. He, he maybe died six months later, right after Bombshell was published. So it was maybe earlier. And uh, they were uncertain as to why the FBI left him alone. They, they, never, they never mentioned the Ed Hall story. They may have known it and been keeping it from me. And so my brother and I had this grand view that maybe the government was afraid of uh, uh, going after a scientist because it might scare other scientists away from working on the project etc. Scientists were too important. But Lindor's view that it was really the military who said, hey, his brother's too important. Leave this guy alone. is fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I, I've told Peter this, and I think you heard this on the second episode. And I'm, I'm not really sure if I'm right on this. But I have a notion that, of course, you have your red hating brought up in wealthier households or very, at least very stern households, generals in the military, and yet others, like even to some extent, Leslie Groves, who was absolutely an anti-communist, who really just wanted to put people on projects to get the project done and didn't really care mm -hmm. that much who they were, at least background wise, it seemed like to me anyways. And I wonder if that was the case with Ed Hall as well. Well, it might've been that admiral who, uh, I think yeah. it was an admiral, who basically told Hoover to back off. But what I found the most interesting about it is that Hoover did. I didn't think Hoover took orders from anybody, but supposedly, according to the Lindorf article, Hoover had a very respectful relationship with this admiral. Interesting. Because Ted and Joan Hall were flabbergasted that the guy who was sweating Ted regularly yeah. uh, was taken off the case. He was pulled, he was sent somewhere else. I, I was also surprised because he was sweating uh, sample sacks as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Was in, was in much more, much less secure circumstances than Ted Hall. Anyway, it's, yeah. it, 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 this is probably one of those opening, uh, um, open questions, which is the thing that I, I kind of like about history. There's a book that was written called Argument Without End. And mm -hmm. it was basically the theme was that history is an argument without end. And, but you learn, you learn something. You get closer yeah. to the yeah. understanding. Absolutely. Ah, I enjoy talking to you guys a lot, and I really enjoy listening to the podcast, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with a lot of people. Great. Great. We really enjoy talking yeah. to you, too, Mike. For sure. Okay. All the best. All, all right. Thanks. Best. You, too. Take care. Bye for now. Thanks for, again for listening. And, of course, please like and subscribe to our show on Patreon and leave a review at your preferred podcast player. Now, today, listeners, fellow scavenger carabinieri, I'm going to leave you with this song pulled from the archive by none other than a young Mike Mirapol himself performing Ian McColl's The Lag Song. Bye for now, listeners. See you next time.
Sometimes I'd wonder what happened to time when it passed. Then one day I found out that time just lands in prison. And there it is held fast. When I was a young man, used to go courting and dream of the moon and the stars. The moon is still shining, the dream. Out of the window and over the roofs there and over the walls, see the sky. Just one flying leap and you could make your getaway if only you could fly. The prison is sleeping. The night watch is keeping a guard over seven hundred men. And behind every cell door, asleep in like he's dreaming. Oh, to be free again. Got time on my hands, I. Time on my shoulder, got plenty of time on my mind. There's no summer, no winter, once you land inside here. Just this old prison ground.